The following podcast is a TJ DeSantis production. Comments, questions, and inquiries can be sent to DeSantisProd at gmail.com. It's time! You asked for it, and you got it. At BruceBuffer.com. Championship introductions at a special rate are now provided for all of you as a keepsake for life, like you are being introduced like a champion in the cage. Just go to BruceBuffer.com. Specials for championship introductions, weddings, birthdays, voicemail, and business recordings. I'm here for you if you need me. Check me out at BruceBuffer.com. TJ, you know I love football, and you know ever since I started this podcast, people have been asking me for advice. You know, usually it's what team to bet on this week. The truth is, I honestly don't know who's going to win, but if you think you know, you got to check out my bookie. You know, I know that you may not know who you're betting on from week to week, but I do know for a fact, you know, who you're betting with. And that is my bookie. And if I've learned anything about you, Bruce, you don't endorse anything that you don't truly believe in. You've done your research. And for good reason, my bookie has stood out as, uh, you know, one of the best uh, sites out there to place your wagers with. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they've been in business for years. They have great reviews online, which I checked out. And the the, the key thing is, which is important to me, is their mobile site is easy to use because, let's face it, we all use our phones these days. I also heard, Bruce, that they have in-game betting as well. So it's not just the typical matchup, you know, Team A over Team B. There's props that come up. There's live betting. There's a lot of other options than just that typical, hey, I'm going to take so-and-so by whatever. Exactly. And when you go to MyBookie, join now, and MyBookie will match your deposit dollar for dollar, whatever you put in. Use the promo code buffer to activate the offer now remember when you do buffer it's all in capitals capital b-u-f-f-e-r so visit my bookie online today that's my bookie m-y-b-o-o-k-i-e and don't forget to use the promo code buffer in capitals when creating your account to claim the bonus hey if you play and you win what happens bruce you get paid With Bruce Buffer. And now, it's time for the voice of mixed martial arts. We are live! It's Bruce Buffer. Bruce Buffer. Hey everybody, it is TJ DeSantis for Bruce Buffer. You are listening this time. Don't worry, Bruce will be back. Uh, and don't worry, we haven't forgot about you. We're not a few days late behind. Sorry, had a issue on the road with some radio, but we are here and, uh, got a best stuff show for you. I think it's a good one. Uh, Ronda Rousey has been absolutely destroying it in the WWE as of late. So why not, uh, grab an interview that talks about the greatness of Ronda and maybe where her origins in professional wrestling and her interest really sort of all started. You know the story about Rowdy Rowdy Piper, but do you know the man behind Rowdy Rowdy Piper? His name is Judo Gene LaBelle, and uh, someone very important to Ronda Rousey, someone very important to Rowdy Piper, someone very important to combat sports, whether it be Judo, obviously, professional wrestling, or mixed martial arts. Gene LaBelle has served as uh, a judge on many occasions for the California State Athletic Commission, so... Uh, figured we'd play an interview we did all the way back in 2015 with Judo Gene. Talk about a variety of subjects and, uh, yeah, some other fun stuff in there as well with Bruce Buffer. So, uh, without further ado, here's our interview with Judo Gene LaBelle. You're listening to It's Time. Talk to you in a couple days. My co-host TJ DeSantis and I have somebody very special coming on board. Somebody who I consider a absolute iconic legendary status not just in the world of professional wrestling not just in the world of the minds of the mma fighters that fight today in the ufc not just in the actors who he's doubled for as a stuntman and done so much work in well over a thousand films and tv shows authoring a number of books we're talking about an american martial artist instructor a stunt performer professional wrestler a man who's lived his life in los angeles california and now is going to come on and share with us his grand knowledge as a 10th degree red belt in judo, a 9th degree black belt in jiu-jitsu. I can't say more about this man, but I can say one thing. He is my friend. Let's bring on the great Gene LaBelle. Hi, Gene. You know, uh, Bruce and company, uh, you know, the, the build-up you gave me, I got to go ask for an 8x10 glossy of this guy. <laughs> he must be somebody special. <laughs> 
You know what, Gene? If you think so and my mother thinks so, then maybe I am so. That's good enough for me. Gene there LaBelle you know. just called you special. You should feel special. I feel. Listen, Gene yeah. LaBelle wrote one of his many books and actually wrote about me in his book. And I got to tell you, when I got to that point, not even knowing he wrote about me, I did a double take, triple take, quadruple take. Wow. I was so honored by that, I can't begin to tell you. Gene, we're really excited to have you on the program, if you can't tell. Well, uh, it sounds good to me. It's not as good as $5 cash, but uh, <laughs> it well, works. And uh, Gene, you're living back in the 50s, man. Fi- today you say $500 cash, okay? <laughs> That's beautiful, $500. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. I'll toss you, a, I'll toss you a fiver any day of the week. So, Gene, this has been a very tough and a very glorious week for you for two reasons. You lost a legendary wrestler and best friend in Rowdy, Roddy Piper, who passed last week, and we're going to touch on that. You watched as your protege and close friend, Rowdy Ronda Rousey, one Saturday night furthering away into legendary iconic status in the world of sports and, of course, the UFC. Let's start with Rowdy Roddy Piper, who's a friend of the show, was on the show, and was one of our more enjoyable uh, interviews that we had as we think back, and I'll, I'll speak for TJ on that too. Tell us about the man, because this man was loved by many. Uh, I certainly you know, liked him very much. Uh, definitely was a fan when I did used to watch wrestling back in the old days and Rowdy would come out and do his thing. His, his, his whole ability to just carry a show and not even that, but his ability to wrestle as an entertainment wrestler, they were both top notch. So tell us about Rowdy, Rowdy Piper and Gene LaBelle's words, please. Good. I could talk forever about Rodney Toombs, which is his, the working name was Rowdy, Rowdy, Ron, uh, Rowdy Piper. Uh, he's, he's born, uh, 61 years ago, 1954, April 17th, and of course he died, uh, July 30th. Uh, when he started wrestling at the Olympic, uh, he was 16, you have to be 18 to, uh, uh, wrestle, but he kind of fibbed about his age. But he was a an orphan, and uh, I said he came to me and he said, "Hey, I want to wrestle as much as I can." So uh, we got together, and I says, "Well, you can't be a good wrestler unless you learn to race motorcycles." So uh, we went out and raced motorcycles, and uh, it was very entertaining to watch him uh, fall down. Uh, he was, we went out riding once with a couple of, uh, wrestlers, the Guerrero brothers, and nobody could make this hill, uh, none of the wrestlers. Of course, I was on a hopped up bike, so I had an advantage. And I says, all you have to do, Roddy, is just put the throttle on and go as fast as you can. And he did that. He went up to the edge. And there was Bob wire on the edge, and uh, he would have gone down the cliff for about uh, two or three hundred yards. But uh, he, the Bob wire uh, stopped him, and he's bleeding like a stuffed pig. But he got up and raised his hands. He says, "That's a win, you know. Uh, I made the hill." Gene, I got to interrupt you a second. Um, TJ and I are kind of looking at each other. We're a little baffled here. You've got to explain why he needed to ride motorcycles to be able to wrestle. My guess is to be able to take the bumps and grinds that you take in situations like that and to toughen them up. Am I wrong or is there something no, else? No, of course you're right. Uh, of course, I'm a motorcycle buff and uh, test bikes for Honda and Yamaha and, and uh, BMW. I have forever and ever. So I have, you know, 30 or 40 bikes. And it was just a joke to start off with. But he got into it and he was... He always called me dad. He, you know, he was a, uh orphan, and uh, I was 11 years older than him. And uh, But we were family, and I've had a lot of people. When you get old, you, you guys are both very young, but when you get old, you'll find out a lot of people die that you know. But this, when Ronnie passed, and it's surprising, you know, it, it really took me and I'm still upset and I probably always will be because I just saw him the day before uh, he passed and he said well I, I, I'm I said how are you doing because he had that cancer scare for about five years 
And uh, he says, uh, I'm doing well. I'm a little tired, but I'm going to bed early tonight. And, uh, of course, his, um, he was staying with his sister down here in L.A., uh, lives up in uh, Oregon, as you know. He lived up in Oregon, and um, that's where the main funeral is. One thing that always, uh, you know, and I don't want to get too deep into it because it's personal, but Roddy, I would assume, made a lot of money in his career at the time. And I know that he uh, basically survived by his wife, Kitty, and he has four kids, three daughters and a, and a son. Who's right also uh, The son, Colton, who's also pursuing a career in professional wrestling. So uh, did he Did he leave? Do you feel that he left enough to take care of his family? Was it the type of money making back then that they make today, or was it? Well, he was making good money, but... You know, when you have a, a big ranch and an overhead and you travel, your overhead is astronomical. Uh, you know, it's uh, he had money, but he wasn't uh, the richest man in the world or the best looking because you're the best looking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gene, my bread is, is being buttered so well today. Thank you. Well, you know, i got to be uh, nice to you because... It just slightly changes subject. We used to play poker, you and I, and uh, uh, you know I uh, I got to have a rematch uh, if you know I don't have any money because you've got all my money. <laughs> and uh, but uh, don't give up uh, your second job as an announcer. I think you can make it there if you stick with it. You know, you might get a good gig someday. Yeah, good gig. I'm trying. I'm trying, Gene. I really am, Gene. I just uh, I'm moving into a new house and I'm building a special poker room. And there'll be two types of games. There'll be the big games and there'll be the friendly games. I'm inviting you over for the friendly game if you know what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've, I I gotta have a friendly uh, friendly game because <laughs> you're mean. You those uh, <laughs> teeth come out. I, I'm sitting down. I say, Hey, Bruce. And you said, I'm a vampire, you know, <laughs> and when you go right for the juggler. You talk about Rhonda being sadistic. Uh, she's only sadistic in the ring or the octagon. You're sadistic at the poker table. Well, you know I love Eugene, but you know I want every single chip sitting in front of you. I'm sorry. If you sit down, you got to play the game. Uh, yeah. That's true. That's we're, not, true. we're not there to make friends because we're already friends. We're there to take each other's money. Uh, not fa uh, f uh, friends, family, Bruce. That, thank you, Gene. Thank you for correcting me, and you're right. Thank you. Love you. Thank you. Yes. Hey, Gene, I want to get back to Roddy Piper for a moment. I grew up uh, in the 80s. I was born in the early 80s and uh, uh, you know, got into wrestling during that sort of rock and wrestling time. And, and when I look at Roddy Piper, I struggle to find uh, a better heel of the 1980s and early 90s. I think he was professional wrestling's best bad guy in that time. You, you, are, are you on board with that? I am. Uh, when you uh, talk layman's language, heel means villain. And the way it is, gentlemen, uh, there's no Indians. you got to be a chief. And you got to stand out, and you got to be different. So, uh, I mean, he wrestled the Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, uh, Ernie Ladd, uh, football player. He, he wrestled them all, and uh, he drew a lot of money in the Los Angeles area, which my family uh, owned uh, this Olympic Auditorium, which you probably saw. Then he went to. New York and became a superstar, you know, and uh, it goes on and on and on. I, I got him his first job as Screen Actors Guild card on uh, a show called The uh, One and Only with uh, uh, the One and Only with uh, what? Henry Winkler and uh, oh, that was the rest. That was a wrestling uh, show. Yeah, yeah. and. Um, you know, I worked out with uh, Henry, Henry Winkler. And, Henry Winkler uh, was playing the gorgeous George type character. Yes, yeah. and so I got a few of the wrestlers on to take falls for uh, Henry, and he says, "Well, how about this kid Roddy Piper?" Well, uh, Henry was playing a German. He took his helmet off, and he was going to supposed to hit him on the head. And I says, well, lay it in a little bit, because he's a method wrestler. 
and he knocked him into the nickel seats with the helmet. <laughs> and uh, then he came after me, uh, Roddy did. He says, you did it again. With the old pro wrestlers, it's who could pay the biggest practical joke. And um, so if you ever see the one and only, you can see him uh, get hit with the... Uh, with the chair by, by Henry. You know, well, it was a chair. It was a helmet, helmet, uh, helmet, German helmet. Well, hopefully it wasn't a German World War One helmet that had the spike at the top, the pith helmet. So let's, let's hope that not. works for me too. Yeah, I bet it would, Gene. When I, I yeah. gotta use one of those when I play poker with you again. There you, go. Yeah, you know what, Gene? You just bring it, okay? Just bring it. <laughs> all right, now, Gene, um, with Rowdy and and all he did in the films, the favorite film of mine of his was They Live, the the one with the aliens coming down to the planet Earth. I thought that was just a fine sci-fi film. Uh, did, just real quick question, then I want to get on to Rhonda. Did you happen to work with uh, Rowdy in that film? No, I didn't. I just the one and only. I pushed him a lot. He didn't need my help uh, because he did public relations. But he, uh, one of his lines there, uh, he likes to beat up people and uh, shoot chew gum, gum and, gum and uh, he gum says, and I'm all ass. out of gum. And then he yeah. shoots the aliens. Yeah, it's, it was this. It was this. I remember the line specifically. I'm here to chew gum and kick ass, and I'm all out of gum. <laughs> yeah. What great. a great yeah. guy. Great, great line. A great, great line. And people have mimicked that line forever. And they will forever, too. Hey, Gene, I'm curious. Um, Roddy Piper, the character, was he any different than, than Rodney Toombs, the man? Uh, all the difference in the world. All the difference in the world. As, uh, he um, would do anything for anybody I mean, he was polite to everybody and courteous to everybody. You know, uh, when you put on that heel or vill villain uh, persona, uh, he, uh, it's a different life, you know. But anything he could do for you, he would do. In the ring, this guy could wrestle. He could tie his shoes. That's the old wrestling Verbiage saying this guy could wrestle. He could box. He could wrestle. He could do the real thing. And he, like, he worked out with me for 30 years. And uh, one of the times I wrestled him, he just ate blueberry pie and um, threw it up right in my face. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> that wasn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's a rough one right there. So I, uh, I gotta, yeah, he threw it up right in my face, and I went right to the showers, and he, he called it a win, and it was. <laughs> I, I, I would say so, definitely. Well, listen, let's just take a, a moment here. I call it a moment of silence between the three of us and our audience, and let's just thank Rodney, uh, you know, excuse me, Rowdy Roddy Piper for all the entertainment, uh, the role model status he held for a lot in the sport of entertainment wrestling, and uh, for being a man's man. And always being, like you said, good to everybody, because that's that's a wonderful quality that we don't see a lot in people much anymore, Gene. Uh, no, it seems the society has changed. Everybody's for themselves. They don't do things for uh, other people. And, I mean, this guy would jump off a building to do something for you. You know, anything he could do, uh, call me up, hey, uh, hey Pops, what do, you, what do you need, you know? And I just said, well, I got to go down to the gym and body slam you. And it was just a conversation. He, When you go down to there to the gym, he'd beat up most everybody real easy. Uh, he was one of the ones, but he'd shake hands afterwards and give him a hug. And uh, they remembered him, you know. Well, we're going to remember him for a really long time. And somebody else I want to go into now that, Hey, real quick, we're not going to do this interview with, with oh, Gene yeah. LaBelle and not talk about the fact that I have a Roddy Piper oh, action yeah, yeah. figure. He has a Roddy, Roddy Roddy Piper action figure. Been here for years. In his hand. Not going anywhere. Yeah, it's been here. This, you didn't get it for the show, Gene. It's been here. We've been doing this for six years. It's been here for six years on his desk. Yeah, yeah I, uh, that, that's good. Uh, he gave me one, too. Uh, you know, uh, Vince uh, McMahon uh, had him made up, uh, I believe. Yeah, yeah he did those. Um so now let's go over to Rhonda, with all respect to Rowdy Roddy Piper. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll always miss him. 
God bless him, you know. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Rowdy Ronda Rousey. At what age did you meet her, and what age did she start training with you, Gene? Well, uh, the thing with um, Rhonda, I don't know if you know her background. I knew her um, mother, Anna Marie, before she was even married or had any kids. Uh, she was a very good judo person, which was my uh, forte, and she won the world's, the world's first American wing uh, uh, win a world's championship in 1984. I mean, she was one of the ones nobody ever heard of her. Now she's Rhonda's mother, and everybody heard her. Uh, you know, a lot of these arm bars, they say, where did you learn them from? You learn, she learned them from her mother, you know. Well, she talks about the fact that her mother would wake her up, put her in an arm bar, and you know, just create her and make her tough from the beginning. Did you see the championship focus in her eyes from the beginning when you first met her, Gene? Uh, yeah, but when uh, she was very young then, and if she was unhappy, she'd cry. You know, she'd cry when she was happy, she'd cry when she's sad, but she could do it. Uh, she just did it, and her mother sometimes would bring her down to the dojo to work out. And if she was unhappy, uh, she'd cry. And then uh, uh, she says, I, I wasn't crying. I wasn't crying. Of course, he was seven or eight years old. And uh, at, right then, you could see there was a champion. And um, like her dad said, you're going to be a champion. You're going to be an Olympian. But he thought she was going to do it in swimming, right? You know, and uh, and she's a you know a world class swimmer, and people don't realize that. Uh, that's why she's got such good shoulders and uh, throws a good punch. Well, one thing is true: she's a world class athlete, and it, and it proves itself. I mean, in her fight with Betch Cohey on Saturday night, which ended in thirty four seconds. Most every fighter that you know I happen to talk to, they all said they didn't think it was going to get out of the first round. Obviously, a striker's chance for Betch, just like Matt Serra against GSP we talked about last week, could have happened, and they did start throwing hard. Um, actually, John McCarthy told me that uh, Ronda got poked in the eye pretty bad. Yes, he did. And unlike, I have, with all respect to other fighters who get poked in the eye, they stop. Ronda didn't stop. She just kept going. I mean, that, if that doesn't give you a telltale sign of Ronda Rousey, that one little factor right there. It's just, it's like, no, I'm not stopping, I'm finishing. Well, uh, first of all, Big John McCarthy is the best referee ever in MMA, and probably the ugliest, and I hope he's <laughs> listening. <laughs> um, I'll let him know you said that, but you probably, oh, already, yeah, you probably already told him. <laughs> tease him, uh, I, I do all the time. I call him the bull, you know, because he's so damn big. And he's a good teacher. He's got a great school near Magic Mountain, if anybody's in that area. But uh, he refereed her first pro fight. That went about 30 seconds, and uh, uh, the last one. But uh, what Rhonda said afterwards, she says that when I hit her, she went out cold, and I wanted to hurt her, but... Uh, Big John picked me up and put me around and said the fight's over with. I, and she wasn't through, you know, but she says, well, I'm satisfied. Except she did go over to Betch, stand over and say, don't cry. Don't which is, cry. Yeah, which is exactly what Betch said to her at the Wayans, if I'm not mistaken. I love Rhonda. In fact, my last loss was to Rhonda when she was uh, eight years old. When she's six, six, she beat me up, but that was lucky. When she was eight, you know, and uh, she could throw me all over the place. you got to watch out for those eight-year-olds, Gene. Haven't you learned that by now? Yeah, that, I'm a slow study, uh, Bruce. <laughs> hey, listen, I had lunch with her coach, Edmund, in Rio on Sunday after her fight. Yeah. A really nice guy. Uh, loves her. They have a very, what seems to be a very special relationship. Um, it was mentioned to me at the table, I won't say who mentioned it because there were some other people there that, the cyborg fight is what everybody is looking forward to seeing. Obviously, they're talking about Misha Tate coming up. Uh, that fight has not been signed. Am I correct, TJ? Not yet, no. Not yet. Do you see that as being the next fight? Uh, uh, 
I, I correct me if I'm wrong, because you people are much more knowledgeable than I am. But I thought December fifth, December fifth, in Dallas, Texas, uh, Ronda was supposed to fight uh, Misha Tate. That's what they're talking about. It has not been confirmed, but that is the scuttlebutt that's out there because to be on the same card as Conor McGregor and Jose Aldo which would make for probably the biggest UFC yet, uh, in my opinion. Um, now, with Cyborg, what was mentioned at the table is that, by a lot of people's estimates, they're all saying 140, 140. The bottom line is Ronda is the Bantamweight 135-pound champion. I feel, personally, and again, I have no say in this. I just do my job announcing, but champion should fight someone who t- wants to take the belt from them as champion, and that weight is 135 pounds. Now, Obviously, if Cyborg comes in at 138, 139, there's going to be some very heavy fines. But I'm sure that when that fight does eventually take place, and hopefully at the 135 mark, she'll be, she'll be offered a very nice purse. And TJ's shaking his head. You don't see it at 135. It should happen at 140. But at 140, uh, there's no championship uh, fight. TJ, you're out of still, line. Is there still a championship fight? No, no, fight? Why, why am I out of line? Well, you? gosh, Howard, you've got to come down to the gym and let me body slam you a bit. <laughs> uh, when you're the champion at 135... Ron, or, but, you want to beat me? You you come down to my weight, you know. Sure. Cyborg's a champion at one forty-five. You're big deal. He's not a UFC champion. Invicta? You know, uh, I, I, I like to. I UFC. personally like to see Misha Tate uh, fight uh, uh, that Brazilian girl. I think Misha Tate might give her a hell of a go herself. Well, how do you feel about Misha? She's training right now very hard. I, I follow her on Instagram. She's got a new strength conditioning coach. She claims she's getting stronger. She's really publicizing the fact of how hard she's training to be stronger. She claims that that's not going to be a less than a minute fight with Ronda. It's going to be totally different this time. Now, I come from the school of styles dictate winners in boxing. Okay. I don't come from the school necessarily that styles dictate winners in MMA because there's so many weapons to choose from. But how do you see the fight from Misha uh, turning out with Ronda? You know, uh, Misha Tate, people underestimate her. She's a damn good uh Wrestler, fighter, I mean, she hit uh, uh, Ronda. Of course, Ronda's getting a little bit better in boxing. I said, you got to bob and weave and, uh, you know, not into those punches. Uh, Misha uh, hit her a couple of times. Misha is better than she's getting credit for, you know, and uh, she, she, it could be a hell of a battle. You know, and if worse comes to worse, it could go into the second round. As long How's as that it... for being a, a, a biased uh, uh, uncle? I don't really see as being biased. I see it as being analytical. Um, no, he's being biased. This man wants to body slam me. But, yes, he does. <laughs> but he also wants to see Ronda Spico pass you know, one round on the next bout. You know, here's the thing. People say, oh, why do I want to pay for a pay-per-view when it's going to end in 34 seconds? Well, in the UFC, we had, and that night, we had 12 other fights. And there were some darn good ones because you're paying for an entire show. That's true. And Ronda is the main event when she comes out. Granted, we'd all like to see, you know, five minutes of back and forth, highly skilled action. But she's just so darn dominant. But I do think we're going to see a different Misha Tate here that could definitely take this longer than the fights. Because my announcement of Ronda, as in every main event, is usually around two minutes by the time I'm done the sponsors and everything I'm required to do. And when I added up the last four of Ronda's fights, my announcement of last Saturday's fight was longer than the last four fights combined. That's yeah, unbelievable. That's crazy. Well, you know, you've got to give Ronda a lot of credit. She's always making TV. She goes all over the United States and uh, goes down to Brazil to make TV. And she, she wrote a book. Uh, uh, you know, she's got so many things in the fire. Uh when I was training, that's all I did is work out. But she's got a lot of, she's a movie star now, and uh, uh, she's she's terrific. I love her dearly, and I love her mother dearly, too. Hey, Gene, I know we got to get you out of here. we got a couple minutes left. Will you indulge me and let me make my case for 140 very quickly? Uh, I will listen to you. Thank you. You got a nice neck for choking. You know that. That's true. That's <laughs> true. That's true. Um, I, 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 we all want to see Ronda tested, and if you want to see Ronda tested, I think she needs to meet Chris at one forty because at one thirty-five, 
it's not a fight. Cyborg will lose the battle before she even gets into the ring because it's it's too much weight to cut. I understand that Ronda is the champion at 135, but it's not about the championship. It's about finding out who wins between those two women. I think both need to compromise a little bit. Uh, Cyborg, you know, loses an, an additional um, five pounds than she normally cuts. She's already massive. She weighed in at, uh, I think, 175 after her uh, fight before last, just two days later. Um, you know, so she's going to be taxing herself. It's a challenge for Ronda to fight a bigger woman at, at a weight that she's not necessarily comfortable with. But it's not like Ronda hasn't competed at a higher weight class before in judo. I, I just think it makes more sense. And if it's going to be something along the lines of this fight happens at 140 or it doesn't happen at all, don't we all want to see it? Yeah, you want to see it. But, you know, uh, Dana White's smart, I think. Uh, I, whatever weight it was uh, or would be a catch weight, Ronda'd still stretch her. Uh, and uh, the other gal's very, very good, very good. But uh, I don't think she's in Ronda's class. You know, it's funny, Jane. You actually sound like you're giving Misha Tate more of an edge on Ronda than you're giving Cyborg. Uh, I am. Huh? I think Misha Tate's. That's what I'm going I'm, a, I'm a fan of Misha Tate. Oh, I, I am too. Most definitely. You know, uh, she's uh, she's very, very talented. She does stand-up. She does groundwork. And that uh, Cyborg is very, very good. But she depends, if you look at her fights, a lot on strength. She overpowers them, you know. And uh, that's where the 135 is a disadvantage, right, right. there. Right. That's yeah. that's why. Yeah, but why give her a dish of advantage? I mean, like when I go to play poker with you again, I'm going to blindfold you <laughs> because I need the advantage. I don't think it would be that much of an advantage, but it would be. I mean, it's all about at this point. We're making the fight, or we want the fight to happen because we want Ronda challenge. I mean, that's the point. Uh, on the poker side, just have your wife, Mitch, call me before you come over that night and just say that you guys had a hard time making the rent last month, and I guarantee you I'm dumping my cash. <laughs> yeah, she enjoyed talking to you, and of course you're her favorite person to dance with. Oh, yeah, no, his wife and I, we cut a rug. Really? Yeah, yeah. we cut a rug, and and, okay. and your wife is like 80 years old or 75 Yeah, days. she's uh, long in the tooth, but she still dances and, uh, you know, I, I never learned to dance, and what is that, at the Rose they, yeah, they I, did. I hosted your roast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Roddy uh, was one of the speakers at the roast. Right. What a great guy! It was, but, a, great, it was uh, a great night, Gene. What I, my impression was watching you uh, dance with uh, Midge for a couple of hours. And I says, "What good condition he's in." Hey, I'm just a gigolo. What can I tell you? Yeah, it works for <laughs> me. <laughs> hey, Gene, I would I would invite myself over to uh, Bruce's house when uh, you guys do in fact play poker, but. Uh, I don't want you to beat me up, so I'm going uh, to. No, hey, anything I can do for you guys. You know, we tease a lot, but, uh, you know, I got uh, a gym called Highest On. a bunch of Armenians there. Oh, I've been Go-car there. It's, and everybody. it's a beautiful it, the gym. The price is right for you guys. Come on down there. There's an octagon, a boxing ring, and... Uh, Guaranteed, you're going to get choked out if you go down there. Oh, it's There's fine. no question. Have you, have you ever it's been to the show? It's a sexual gym? thing of getting choked out. What's wrong with that? Uh, now, now you really got me scared, Gene. Sincerely. No, I, I, in all seriousness, I've been to Highest Time before and, and hung out with Gokor. It is an amazing gym. It's I, one of the nicest gyms I've ever been in. I've known Gokor for probably 17 years. Actually, announced one of his fights non UFC down in Alabama one time. Wow. He took the guy out in like 20 seconds. Frank yeah. Shamrock was on the card. Don Fry was on the card. I forget the name of the show, but well, it was one of those. Events trying to be a UFC coming out sure, of the game. Sure, I got you. Know, back you. In I got you. Hey, last thing, real quick. Real no, quick, no, no, I got two things. Just go. one thing. Um, highest on when I was there, the kids were doing judo, Bruce. It is amazing to see seven-year-old kids throw one another and just get back up and do it again. It was let a me, drill. It was amazing. Gene, let me tell you something. I achieved a green belt in judo when I was twelve. It was my first martial art, and I still to this day never forget a sparring session I had with another kid who was about a year older than me. And, you know, sure, I, I would land the Osoto Garis and all that, but I threw him on a hip throw over my shoulder the way Ronda did in the uh, WWE wrestling thing that she did. And it, I, to this day, will never forget the feeling I got watching that man, or that kid, rather, on the ground, knowing that I flipped him literally feet over head over my shoulder. Right. I still, to this day, remember it. Yeah. It was well, uh, if you can remember your wins, all I remember is my losses, and that was all <laughs> to Ronda when she was young, but... Uh, 
you know, a lot of people don't know. Uh, I was in the first uh, TV uh, mixed martial art event in 19, 1963 with uh, Milo Savage as a rated guy. And that's uh, over 50 years ago, and it's uh, still history. I mean, and it's surprising I'm still alive. It's a criminal thing that. I'm alive and uh, 21 or 22 years older than Roddy, but, uh, you know, God bless him, and also God bless your mother, sweetheart, okay? Oh, thank you, Gene. Anything not... else I, I yeah. can do for you? You need any dragon slain or anything <laughs> like that? Gene, that'll be the call on the private bat phone, the Gene LaBelle phone, and I'll talk to you about that tomorrow, because I do have a couple issues we got to talk about. Um, yeah, I can uh, be on again and uh, or anything you want. You got it. Listen, Gene, two questions real quick. You're 83 years old now. You're still doing stunt work. When the hell are you going to take it easy with Midge? Lie by the pool drinking some mojitos during the day? Play poker at night, relax? Or do you have to keep moving like a shark? Uh, I'm trying to retire. I tell everybody I'm retiring. And isn't that your good? If they know you, they hire you. Some director or producer say, hey, Gene, I need you for the day. You know, and... Uh, it pays pretty good money, and it's residuals, which means you get paid again uh, when they show it, and uh, goes to my retirement. I get a pretty good retirement, and I still work, but I'm trying to retire, so uh, don't call me for work. Okay, you got and it. And when I come over for a poker game, I want you to feed me, because I need that, too. I'm going to hire a private chef. I'm going to have some beautiful girls serving us drinks, so I hope you don't mind the atmosphere, Gene. Well, God damn it, I'll, I'll wear my good glasses <laughs> then. <laughs> All right, Gene, one last thing. We all, many of us in the MMA world and the martial arts world have heard the infamous story about you and uh, martial artist actor Steven, Steven Seagal. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to describe what happened. We've talked about that on our own. I just want to ask you one question, What? and then we'll end the show. What is your opinion of Steven Seagal, the man? Uh, he's a great actor, a great martial artist, and I can't say anything else because the lawyer's will get on to me. But I'll tell you something real funny, and I'll try to make this quick. Rhonda, uh, my niece Rhonda, she's interviewed and talking about that same subject on television. And she got so mad, she says, Gene, at his age, he'd still stretch you again. <laughs> and, if, and if he doesn't, I will. And I said, Rhonda, you know, don't say that because... If if you do and you, you of course you'll beat them, and uh, then it may, you know I'm a hero because they think I beat somebody tough, even if he can't tie his shoes, <laughs> you know. And uh, so uh, be modest and humble. That's the way to be through life. To, uh, be, to be great is to be humble, Gene. And yeah, that's where you, that's where you are. Stevens uh, good at what he does, and uh, more power to him. Sounds good, Gene. You're a legend, Gene. You're a legend. Thank you for making our show legendary today. Thank you for coming on. And uh, what can I say? It's a pleasure. I love you, Gene. Family love sticks by you family. Too. Always have. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care, champ. See you, Gene. Hey, hey. Bye, Gene. There he is, Gene LaBelle. Gene LaBelle. That is a legend. That is yeah. truly, truly a legend. Right. Do that question. Uh, you want to take a little break on the show? Nope. Go right into some news? Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's do this. Let me hit the fancy pants bed. Okay. Uh... You heard about the Subway sandwich situation with Jared, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and we and we said allegedly. Right, but it's still just, it it's keeps still, looking worse for this man. It's looking worse because now they reportedly have texts where Jared's bragging about sex with a 16-year-old girl. And it's not just bragging about sex. He reportedly paid $100 to have sex with the 16-year-old girl in a counter that he coined with, the, excuse me, called literally, quote, amazing. So now, Still allegedly. Still allegedly, of course. We have to say that. I'm just reading what you know what the report came through. The FBI subpoenaed these text messages between Jared and, and the subway employee uh, with whom he was having a sexual relationship. Oh, Jared was cranking it out, huh? And according to this report in 2008, Jared wanted the woman, this woman who he talked to, to advertise herself on Craigslist to have sex with other men so he could watch. And he allegedly said he would pay $500 for the encounter. Now, I think the biggest question here is the fact that he was paying an underage girl, which backs up to a degree, the 
the other issue at hand, which is all the pedophilia stuff they found trying to connect him. So he's Again, definitely got, it just doesn't look good. It and, doesn't look good. And, you know, this I, I don't want to say that he was a rags to riches success, but he was definitely living a life of, you know, uh, not being happy. And it seemed like he changed everything the way that he wanted it to and had, I mean, the the world was his oyster, essentially. He was the American dream. And again, still, this is all alleged, but it just, it's all gone. Like, even, even if this, even if he's acquitted of everything and everything goes away, he's ruined. He is absolutely destroyed. Yeah, you can't get away from the label. You just can't get away from it. No. Snoop Dogg's been having, a, I, I gotta leave it at that, we'll see what happens, you know, I'm not gonna sit here and condemn the man, but right. I'm just telling you the facts are, are being put in the press, and it's not very enjoyable to read. Um, Italian people, Italian people, <laughs> the Italian police, uh, Snoop Dogg's having some issues, he's doing like this tour in Europe, Right. he had this problem in Sweden, felt that he was being profiled, the way he was pulled over and treated, and he wasn't arrested. Probably just pulled over because he's Snoop Dogg. Well, they pulled him over claiming, you know, they smelled... Well, yeah. So um, not out of the ordinary with that gentleman. Not in the ordinary. Now he's over in Italy, and he's two hundred five thousand dollars lighter because the Italian police sees two hundred five thousand in cash from him at the airport. Now in Minnesota, we have a saying for that, and it says "ufta." Well, during a normal check, get this. Uh huh. He was found with four hundred twenty-two thousand eight hundred twenty dollars. You're not allowed to have that much money. You can only have ten thousand pounds, right? Uh, or ten thousand euros, excuse me. Which is which is roughly eleven thousand dollars, right? Otherwise, and the reason for this is because of money laundering right. and yep. drug trafficking and all that stuff. So, to be exact, the Italian finance police sees two hundred five thousand nine hundred thirty three dollars of the four hundred and change. I don't know why they came up, how they came up with that figure, but he arrived in the country's southern region on a private jet. I'm sure that's the case. He told the police with cash that, that the police that the cash was to pay his band for concerts in Italy and elsewhere. Well, that's not really, in my opinion, a good answer because. You're not dealing with money that's going to a bank that's trackable. You're dealing with being paid in cash. There could be a whole uh, little vault of issues opened up with this. You can't do things like that with that uh, massive amount of money. I mean, it's unfortunate. We we can talk about political debate about how uh, capital is exchanged between parties, but the bottom line is money needs to be tracked. Money needs to be accountable. And you might be able to get away with it, you know, a few thousand dollars at a time, not a few hundred thousand dollars at a time, though. No, it's just it, it goes against the rules. Yeah. So uh, we'll see what happens there. And uh, listen, I'm happy to see the Snoop Dogg's making a lot of money. Yeah, no. Like, like we mean, didn't think so or know that. Yeah, uh, he's, uh, he's a success story for sure. Another surfer, another Australian surfer was attacked by a great white. I saw this. Um, he fed it off or warded off the shark attack by punching the predator after it bit his leg like a 16-inch gash. Yeah. It also bit his arm. He's a 52-year-old man who's an ex-boxer. Oh, wow. So yeah. he had some power. So he, so he had some power. Uh, reportedly, he's an ex-boxer. He spotted what he thought was the shark, warned his friend to get out of the water. As he paddled towards shore, the shark bit his left leg, knocking him off the surfboard. He punched him in an attempt to scare it away. During the struggle, the shark also bit his left arm, and they're suspecting that it's a great white. I, you, you know, know, again, it is rare. I'm telling you it again, it's so rare to even have a shark attack, but we're just reading about this a lot. It's a lot. What is it, like seven this year, seven shark attacks? No, it's more than that. There is was it? like seven or eight in North Carolina or South Carolina was, alone. Okay. So we're well um, over ten. Here's the problem um, with the punching, too. They say to punch it in the nose and it should go away. If you're underwater, you have no punch. No, you don't. Be above water, you do. But the reason the punching in the nose because that's where all his nerve sensors are. Right. And that's why he feels it kind of like you know uh, Rockwell. You know. Yeah. Feeling it and stopping. It's going to definitely affect you. But it is what it is. It's just uh, surfing is surfing, and they're still going to keep surfing. So now let's talk about another animal that. Now I want to hear your opinion on this as a hunter. Mm-hmm. Cecil the lion. We haven't talked about this yet. We didn't. We didn't touch on it last week. It's to my like knowledge, old news at this point. It's, but yeah, but no, it's, it's actually getting more news. They're trying to extradite. He the should dentist. be extradited. They're trying to extradite yeah, him there. He should be extradited. Now he broke a law in a different country. Yeah, and I've talked to a, a couple of hunters. You know, I'm not a hunter, and they're all bringing yeah, up the uh, just, fact. Just for clarification, you are not a hunter. I am no longer a hunter, but have hunted most of my life. And I was about to say that's why I want your opinion. Right. So the problem here. Is I understand. First of all, I could never see myself, even as a hunter, right, taking out a lion or a tiger. There's no reason why? to. There's no reason There's to. No, I mean, I grew up hunting for food. We did not hunt for trophy. Did you put heads on the wall? No, we did not hunt for trophy. That to me is absurd. Every time I walk into a place, I yeah. see heads on the wall of like a, an animal that you don't eat. I'm like, why? No, yes and no. I feel if I if I I'm going to use a, a word that might upset people, but if I harvest an elk, I'm going to eat that elk. 
the head and antlers are going to go to waste. I can mount that if I want to. Yeah, that's your choice. Right. But you ate it. Uh, correct. Okay. Right. Now, I don't know why you would ever shoot something that you were not going to eat. Now, some can say, well, he made a rug out of it. You don't need a rug. You and granted, you don't need, I don't need to go hunt an elk to eat, but there's some tradition there. I mean, I- I'm sorry. Again, even if you make a rug, it's just a trophy of your kill. I don't know why you would ever want to kill something just to kill it. It just doesn't make sense to me. And I know a, a lion is majestic and beautiful and is a quote unquote beast of the world. Let it, let it be the, a beast. The, let pic- it... the picture of him holding the lion underneath his right. forearms in the stand up position is one of the most startlingly sickening shots right. I've ever seen. And this man is already a convicted poacher. He killed a black bear in Wisconsin. That I didn't know about. And here's the other thing, too, is that when I talk to a couple hunters, that their excuse is. Or if they can see anything. People defended this guy? Yes, they're, de- they're defending. They're ridiculous. They're saying that the crime is with the people he paid. because th- That might be true. But, but here's why. Now, they're saying that these hunts that they do, and again, I, you just can't make me agree with it. It's just my own moral standard. But they said that they actually have to thin the herd sometimes. And the lions that they, or the, the animals they kill, they wind up selling and getting enough money for them for whatever they're selling them for. Right. To buy more land so more animals can live. And I don't get this. No, that might be true uh, to a certain extent, buying more land and turning it into a preserve. But he, here's the bottom line. That was a world-famous lion. Um, that they, they actually caused yeah, to leave its, its right, habitat. Right. Yeah. Now, the the thing about it is he can say, oh, I didn't know what I was doing was wrong. Okay, so if I'm going 75 miles an hour in a 35-mile-per-hour zone, is that okay because I didn't know what the posted speed limit was? No. When you're going to go to a different country and you go to countries all the time, uh, you should at least know what the local laws are, especially if you're going to run around with uh, a bow and arrow and try to kill things. I mean, when I went to Macau, I made sure that if I spit on the sidewalk that that wasn't an offense that could land me in jail. When you're in jail, they'll, they'll whip right. you with a cane. Right. That's Singapore, not Macau. But you know why I know that? Because I looked it up. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, I remember that young kid, 14 years old. He couldn't get back. He got whipped with a cane in Singapore. Yeah, because I think he went on a uh, graffiti fest or whatever. So, I mean, the, the, the bottom line is ignorance is no excuse. And you're going to have a very hard time winning, to me, even a hunter over when you run around and just kill things for sport. There's no – and I'm sorry. The fact that they – Led this lion away, brought out a spotlight, he shot it, and him. then followed it. For, that's not a sport. Followed it for 40 hours. That's not a sport. I got it. No, that's a crime, in my opinion. I mean, if he, I don't, I have not looked enough into the Zimbabwean laws about hunting There's a lions. lot of issues with the government in Zimbabwe, right. period. I, I haven't looked at the hunting laws in Zimbabwe. I don't know uh, what the rules are on hunting a lion. That's something you probably can do because people do hunt lions. Um, but some, I can't imagine that shooting a line in a spotlight is legal. Um, I just, I don't, I don't understand it. You're not well, going to have he, any, no, the, the, the thing that pe- people are saying, oh, he should be killed. No, he shouldn't. He no, shouldn't no, be no, killed. no, 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 no. Should he be extradited? I think so. He broke a law. If he broke a law in that country, then I say fine. If they, if they can somehow extradite him, I do not see the American government doing that, but you right. never know. The backlash could be one that created I'll say one thing, though. This guy's practice back home is a dentist. Right. You know where he's from, right? Minnesota, Minneapolis. Yeah, I, I, I know exactly where his dentistry is. So it's like, what do you think is going to happen to his dentistry? Oh, it's shut down. It's uh, shut he's down. He's done. He's done. He'll probably be able to come out of hiding in five years. Something like that. People well, forget. We'll see what happens. I just find the whole thing. It's the flavor of the week, though, it's, Bruce. It's Everyone's up in arms about it. Jimmy Kimmel's crying. Well, yeah, but a lot of people are also saying, okay, now we're all up in arms about, and I, I can see a point here, but I mean, we can be in up in arms about different things. They're up in arms about Cecil's killing. Why are we not up in arms about the 8 million children a year or whatever right. is in America that die from starvation? Right. Uh, you, know, you know, they uh, they, went to, they went to Zimbabwe. I don't know who it was. Some news outlet went to Zimbabwe and asked the local... Um, the locals there, what you thought about Cecil the Lion dying, and they go, oh, Cecil died? That's that's really sad. He was killed by somebody? Oh, that's really sad. What what do I think about it? Oh, I'm too busy trying to make sure I can feed my family to yeah. worry about things no, like there that. No, is there is a level of importance there. There's no question. I say that with all respect to both parties. Um, getting away on a little lighter side, because the, I think we'll be talking about this subject, because something's going to come up about this subject in the next weeks and months of what's going to happen to this dentist. So I have to follow this. Uh, Michael Jordan retired mm-hmm. for since what eighty eight uh, ninety eight was it? So we're talking he came le- back in the two thousands and played for the Bobcats. For Let's say he's retired there. for fifteen years. Well, that's Pick a good basketball. number. Okay, 
His cards, you know I always tell you that the most collectible cards are pre-1975. Correct. There's, There's a 19, few. Yeah, on, on eBay, which is a haven for selling. Sports and memorabilia is just going, like, off the hook. It's, I, and in my move, I found so much sports memorabilia. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, it's crazy. I might even eBay some of the stuff soon because um, I got duplicates. Uh, 97, 98 Fleer Metal Universe Precious Metal Gems Emerald Michael Jordan card. There's 10 that were made. Okay. And it was auctioned off. Are you going to tell me you have one? No, I wish I did, and I'll, and I'll, you'll know why. My next time I open my mouth, what do you think it went for? Uh, five grand. Ninety-one thousand three hundred. Wait, what? Ninety-one sold. Ninety-one thousand. Nineteen ninety-eight. Nineteen ninety-eight. Ten. No, ninety-one thousand three hundred dollars. Oh my goodness! There is another card which has a piece of a game jersey, and it's autographed by Michael Jordan. It's a nineteen ninety-seven upper deck game jersey autograph card. It's not sold yet. It's being looked at a lot on eBay. And the buy it now price is what do you think it is? Well, that one's ninety one thousand. This is a game used jersey. I'll game use piece of a game used jersey. Game use piece. Of, I'll say I'll say seventy five hundred. One point five million dollars. Wait, right there. One point five million. That's the asking price. That's though. right. No one's gonna buy that. We'll see. No one's gonna buy. See how that. it says popular. That's is it the only one ever made? Uh, that. I cannot say. Yeah, I'd have ridiculous. to do research on I the mean, card, but that's the price that they're asking I for. I can put my Roddy Piper doll on eBay and ask for a million dollars. Doesn't mean I'm going to get it. Get this. There's 23 days left on this auction. Uh-huh. There's 145 people watching. Sure, they're watching it because it's priced at a million dollars. I they're, know. That's, they're not knowing. Bookmark that and tell me in 20 whatever days. I'm going to do that for you. If it's still there, because yeah. no way. But the collectibles are going crazy. I just, again, I can go on and on and on about collectibles. I, I find it crazy that you haven't gone on Pawn Stars yet. Well, they even asked me, you know, and I, I was I'm, I was trying to create my own show. I would like to make that happen for you. I, I actually, would like you to go in there. I mean, obviously, all of that stuff is a bit. You don't really have to want to sell anything. It's reality television. But I would love to see you go on there and talk about some of the, the stuff. I was blown away by the stuff that you had in your house when I came over. Thank you. When I get finished with the new house, you'll be able to view it much God, better. God, absolutely blown away. Thank you. That, that, that means a lot to me because that's years and years and years. Of collecting. And I mean, that's a it collection. Right. It's not... I mean, a lot of people say, oh, I collect this. Okay, you have it in a box in your closet. Like, you have a proper display about things. It's absolutely uh, amazing. Thanks. Sincerely. It's a very passionate thing with me. I mean, I told you, I live my life by passion. Collecting is one of my passionate things. Uh, kudos to Tom Cruise. He's proved himself to still be a big star. Uh, Rogue Nation, Mission Impossible, opened up to an estimated 56 million U.S. box office. And uh, another... Sixty-five million abroad, giving one hundred twenty-one million on the first weekend. That's crazy. It's almost more crazy than Tom Cruise. And that stunt of him hanging on the side of the plane—he really did that. No, he didn't. He really did that. Really? Good yeah, for I, him. I read the story last week. He, they put him in a special harness. He actually had him loosen the harness because he couldn't move and show the emotion he needed to show. Right. Uh, but they went up to, and I'm guessing here, I want to say it was around two hundred fifty miles an hour or something at one peak point. Wow. And they had a rig to pull him in the plane when they reached a certain level. He did the stunt himself. Oh, give give Tom Cruise a lot of credit. Seriously, uh, that's still crazy and, again, almost as crazy as Tom Cruise. Yeah, well, you know what? He's an actor's actor. That man works hard on his movies. There's no question. One of my, I'm it's one of my favorite actors. Okay, so uh, anyway, we're going to close out the show now. Again, we want to mention our friendly, friendly famous site, uh, socialunderground.com. Some of the most interesting eclectic selection of stories you get. Please check out socialunderground.com. Uh, keep those recordings coming in, folks, because I'm still busy, busy, busy every week, and I love every recording I do for those birthdays, weddings, and and I did I did I did three births of a baby in the last two months. I three. know you said that last time. It's yeah. absolutely mind blowing. It's mind blowing. It's it's crazy. Yeah. And I we just got a Kristen just got another inquiry just on uh, Friday for, for another, another one. birth. Yeah. So my baby's been born in two weeks. What would it take to get Bruce to wow. do whatever? It's amazing. Yeah. So and those are they're, they're they're just sending those in thinking nobody's ever done it before because they they started off saying I have a very strange request. Sure, well, it was not strange. We're getting these requests. I'm gonna get candid right now. What? My, my wife wants another baby. Go to work. I don't know. Oh, Oliver should have another. I'm not sold on it. How old is Oliver? Four. Is now or never? Well, I I got a good name. I'll tell you it off the air. Okay. I listen. I I'm about you. Do whatever makes your family. I mean, happy. she's not sold on it, but she's. Kicking around the idea a lot more than she has. Well, that should tell you one thing, that when you're kicking around your uh, wife in bed, you hey, better be careful. Hey. You better be careful. Don't put that on me. It, it, it is on you. It's not on me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. We'll be back next week um, with a really good show. As always, uh, It's Time Radio is just going gangbusters right now, and we have you, our listeners, to thank. Subscribe to us on iTunes, SoundCloud. 
Check out archive shows at each site and also at BruceBuffer.com. And that's where you go for those special recordings. Just go to BruceBuffer.com. Thank My, Gene LaBelle one more time. Gene that LaBelle, was amazing. Great. Love you, Gene. Love having you on the show. Uh, check TJ out on Twitter at TJ DeSantis. Send your questions in for us to TJ DeSantis at SureDog.com. Those are questions about anything you want to talk about. We're no holes barred here. And, of course, questions for our sex and relationship show, uh, which we have once a month around the third week of the month. Uh, quick plug real quick. Thursday night live on SureDog.com. I'll be calling the fights for the Tachi Palace Fights promotion uh, in Central California. Uh, one of the premier... Uh, farm systems, I guess you would call it, for the Open Fighting Championship. There's a lot of guys that get signed every year out of uh, the Palace Fight uh, organization there. So uh, hopefully uh, you'll watch it on SureDog Thursday night. Look at that. You are, you're you working like every other week. I'm trying. It's, it's starting to work. It's starting to click. You're doing uh, UFC-friendly shows. Invicta, yep. And, Invicta and this one. And I'm beginning to think that in my guesstimate, if I could be a Karnak for a second like Johnny Carson used to be with the big thing on my head predicting the future... As the UFC grows, TJ, you might you might get a spot. That's the goal. You Someday. might get a spot. You may Someday. be saying, uh, let's go to Bruce Buffer. And I would love to say, and for our particulars, here's Bruce Buffer. Well, you know, if I was ever asked about it, I would tell him because you do a damn good job. Thanks. I really, really, I tell that to all, I'm telling you all listening, TJ DeSantis is a fine commentator and just going to get better and better. As he as he proves his art more and more in the in the uh, events that he's working, you Good know job, I, I get to pick your brain. I get to pick Annex brain because I do his podcast as well. So it's uh, yeah, I've got uh, I've got some good uh, good mentors in this business. Uh, you can't get much better than John. In that position. It's pretty good. It's pretty pretty darn good. All right, everybody, thank you for tuning in. We really appreciate it. We'll be back next week with a great show. Treat everybody around you with respect. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Be a role model to your sphere of influence because life is worth living. Set your goals. Write them down. Stay focused. Go for them. You can achieve anything you want in life. We're all created equal. It's about the paths we choose. Be the best you can be on the path that you choose. Thank you for tuning in. We'll be back next week. Buffer out. It's time with Bruce Buffer is a TJ DeSantis production and is property of Buffer Enterprises Incorporated. Its content is intended for private use only. 